very excited about my sermon this morning. The title of my message is Productive or Destructive. Productive or Destructive. We're going to talk about how we can find out if our lives are productive or if our lives are destructive. Now, when I say destructive, I'm not always meaning about really horrible choices that might put you, um, you know, in a crack house or put you in a or put you somewhere in Skid Row, or put you in certain situations of life. It could be that. It could be as far as we choose to go in the area of destructive, or destructive can just be an another aspect of our walk with God and, and kind of where we end up. But I'm going to speak on productive or destructive this morning. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five. This is my favorite translation because it's just right there. No talents, just five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who received the five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with the two bags of gold gained two more. But the one who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been a faithful with few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags of gold. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Now, this a lot of people think this is a very, very unfair scripture, but, but God's teaching us something here. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, bless this word today. I pray that you would just allow us to be productive for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The other day I was, gonna, I was going for a walk because I can't run right now because I'm out of shape. But I was, gonna, I was going for a walk. I can't believe it's come down to this. From World Marathon Challenge two years ago to going for a walk. But you got to start somewhere. But, uh, and, I, and I went home and I was, I was going to just go out just for a little walk. And I look and, I, and I, I saw my shoes. I have several pairs of shoes. And I grabbed my first ones and all the shoelaces were ripped. I'm like, man, okay, I'll get another one. I went to the other one and those shoelaces were ripped. I went to the third pair, and those were ripped. And I went to, like, old Marathon Challenge leftover shoes that I had, and those were ripped. Every single one of the shoelaces on my shoes were ripped. And then I realized that it was my dog. My dog had ripped every single one of my shoelaces on every one of my tennis shoes. When we were out of the house, she went to town. Now, there's two sermons here. Number one, don't leave your shoes on the ground, and it's my fault. But number two, the second sermon in there is that if we are not left to be productive, if we have too much time on our hands, we can oftentimes be very, very destructive. And that dog is a picture of our lives, my life, and many times. If we don't find something productive to do, we will find a way to be destructive. Because we were born to live passionate lives. In one way or another, we will find a way to live a passionate life. There's nothing more dangerous than a person who has a lot of idle time to let their life, to let their imagination swim in this kind of unproductive place. And it's amazing how many enemies that we can create with an idle mind. It's amazing how many conspiracy theories we can create when our mind is idle. Have you ever seen those people that have way too much time on their hands at home and they have conspiracy theories and they have like pictures all over their walls and maps linking everything back to like a certain president 40 years ago and they got all these weird, and there's, I saw a thing on ESPN of this guy who can uh, literally track the Cleveland sports jinx history 
and then all the, all the way back to a trade that happened, and he has all these links as to why his team is forever jinxed. You know why that stuff happens? Because we have way too much idle time in our brains to start thinking about crazy stuff. Left to ourselves, we can think ourselves into hating people that don't deserve to be hated and creating monsters in our head that should never have been created. A destructive mind is, is bored with life for one simple reason. A destructive life is a life that has simply stopped trying. A destructive mind sees boredom, but if you look at life, life is not boring. Life is actually very, very exciting. And I think one of the problems in life is that we don't give ourselves the permission to be amazed by God's creation, uh, the things that God has given us. The parable of the talents, the master leaves bags of gold. I love it. Just so simple. Bags of gold, he leaves. He gives five to one, two to one, and then one to the other. The man that he gives five to goes out, does something productive with it, produces five more. The one who has two goes out, does something productive, and he creates two more. And the one who has one did something that was rather quite destructive in the eyes of the master, and that was he decided that he wanted to play it safe. And he came back, the master, and he said, well done for, uh, for taking and doing something with the five. And he gave the man with five bags of gold who came back with ten the same praise that he gave the man who had two that came back with four. Well done. You are a profitable servant, a productive servant. But the master was so angry at the one who buried his treasure and didn't thank him for storing his treasure and condemned him for doing nothing with it. The master was displeased and saw the action of not multiplying what this man was given as actually a destructive thing. He's speaking to this man not as if he did something that was safe. He spoke to him as if what he did was destructive. A destructive is not just doing something evil. A destructive life is also a life that slowly wastes away in irrelevance. The man thought he had been cautious with the one talent by hiding it, but the master was so upset that the man wasn't doing something with the opportunity that was given. Destructive lives are not just ones that make a lot of really big sins or commit a lot of big mistakes. A destructive life can be a life that buries their potential into the ground and never gives it the opportunity to become what it could be. Because left to our own thoughts, we can be destructive and we can be stagnant and we can be dangerous. In 2 Corinthians it says, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought obedient to Christ. An idle mind is not a mind that takes things captive. It's a mind that entertains destructive patterns and fantasies that are born out of boredom and that are born out of imagination. You will either use your imagination to produce or we will use our imagination to create fantasies and illusions and things that, that exalt themselves against the power of God. A productive life is creating new memories all the time by the way in which it engages life and it engages new experience. What does a productive life look like? It's not just doing great things and stepping out of our comfort zone, but it's also a life that is productive with our words because living a life of encouraging words is a life of adventure and it's a life of excitement. We were born to build and to create and to fight complacency by living a life of adventure. Productivity is the tenacity to fight against the urge to only want to exist. And there are so many ways in which we can be productive in life. There's so, how many here know there's so many ways we can make a difference? Every day there's so many ways. I, I've got a new ministry I started the other day because here's what happened. I was, I was at home, I was thinking about 25th year anniversary, and I'm just sitting home, what are some new ministries we can start? Like, what are some new ministries? And, and I'm thinking about these big ideas and big vision and all this, and, and God spoke to me and he said, well, you can start a new ministry right now. I go, what are you talking about? And, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, you order Postmates, right? You know, the little app where you order food and they come to your door and they bring it? I said, yes. Well, you can start a new ministry in 15 minutes. And I said, what's that ministry? And God spoke to me. He said, I want you to tip every single time you Postmates the person 40%. I want you to tip 40%. I want you to have the Postmates ministry. 
And so I said, 40%, God, that's ridiculous. That's reckless. That's irresponsible. Have you ever told God that you're way more responsible than he is, you know? And uh, I'm like, God, that's not a good stewardship. That's like burying your talents. I'm trying to use the word of God against the one who wrote it. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to do all this. That's not even good stewardship. But he said, no, I want you to have the, the tipping ministry of Postmates. That's your new ministry. Every time you order it, I want you to get 40%. Every time. I'm not going to tell you where I live because some of you be showing up at my door. But anyways, uh, 40% every single time. And I'm like, man, that's a lot because it's already expensive delivery, you know. And I'm like, okay, okay, that's my new ministry, 40% every time. So I'm, I'm probably not going to order Postmates like ever again. But uh, no, I will because you don't get this big without not feeling the urge and responding to it. But um, 40%. And do you know how happy people are at the door? Like, usually when I study for sermons, I always post mates because I'm just, I get locked in. I don't want to get in the car. I want to break train of thought. And so whenever I'm studying or writing a book or something, I've always, I'm post mates. I know. So you'll say, well, that's expensive, but, but time is money. When you're in the flow of writing, that's like the most important thing you could do at that time, right? When you're hitting the, the, the hot streak. And so they come to the, and this one guy got so excited. Uh, he, he, was, he was an older man. He said, 40%. I said, yes. And, uh, and I said, I just want to bless you. He got so happy. And I give him cash, not on the app, but I have to wait like three days for it. And uh, just right there. And he's just, like, he's just so happy. One person hugged me. And one person said, um, can I, is there a way we can designate, I bring you all the food. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm maybe, I don't know, but I got to bless everyone. I can't just bless you, you know. And, and I, I'm thinking about all this big ministry I can start. And God said, no. You don't need to worry about starting a big ministry right now. All you need to do is you can start any ministry that you want, any time that you want, any time that you choose to be compassionate. <laughs> ministry is not a building. It's not a hospital and all these big things. And Although I believe God's going to give us one more hospital. People ask me the question, what's the one thing that you want to see happen? I want one more Dream Center hospital. One more. Just like one we have maybe in South Central somewhere or I don't know. But just one more hospital. That's what we want. Uh, but until then, why not have a Postmates ministry? You know, I think many times we just think that it's all, everything that we need to do is based on big ideas and big plans. But oftentimes God wants us to start little ministries within ourselves that keep our heart alive, that keep us alive, that keep us going. The dreamers need to stay alive, and the way that the dreamers stay alive is they keep their instincts alive to be productive with whatever opportunities that they have before them. Because the Bible says if you have the opportunity to do good and you withhold it, that's not a very good thing, right? God wants us to use the opportunity that we have, if we have it, with, with the possibility of doing good. The other day, um, there's this, this uh, housewife that um, she grew up with a marketing experience in the past, but she hasn't used it for a long time because her husband is rather successful, so she hasn't had to really use a lot of, uh, of her marketing from the past. And she wants to, but, and her kids are moving out. And she, the other day, she said, I want, I want your daughter to send me all of her clippings of her races and, and all the news articles, all the stuff she's done. She said, I made my daughter a booklet. And you won't believe that this booklet, recruiting booklet she made for her daughter was one of the most insane things I've ever seen. Going back to like when she won when she was eight years old, nine years old, like, I mean, it was outrage. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Telling her story of all of her record-breaking times and meets that she's won and breaking them down. And she said, if you don't mind, she goes, I would like to make one of these for your daughter. And I want to make every single accomplishment so when she sends them to the, to the dream colleges that, that they'll have it. And she put together, she, and it'll be done by Tuesday, this scrapbook of, of my daughter that is so amazing. And she said, I've never been more happy in my life. She said, this was what I was born to do, and I haven't done it for years. And now I feel so productive. I feel so useful again. I feel like making a difference because within all of us, there is a ministry. You have a marketing potential you haven't used for years, go out and just help somebody, market someone, find somebody that, that needs your expertise. There is a ministry inside of us. Look within your skill sets. There's something that is there. I mean, maybe you're a great dressmaker. Have a prom dressmaking ministry, right, where you make cool dresses for people. Use what you have to do good. Because ministry can be all day and all night. It's just, it's a ministry, is a condition of your heart. Ministry is now. It's the next step of productive action. Uh, some of you have the, the gift of the ministry of wisdom, the productivity. 
and, and, uh, and always sharing wisdom with me after a service. We have people here always come and share little nuggets of truth. That, that's being productive with knowledge, being productive with encouragement, being productive with something God has given you. Because we're either going to be productive or destructive at the end of our life. And one of the biggest evidences of a destructive life is this, is having a lot of time to talk about other people. If you have large blocks of hours to tear someone down, then it's time to produce a more productive way of life. A productive life is not just helping others, but it's also spending time helping yourself. It's speaking life to yourself. You see, the enemy loves self, self-doubt because it's a chain of destructive uh, behavior that happens. You start speaking down on yourself, then that comes out of you, and you start speaking down on others, and before long, it becomes a chain reaction. But a productive life is where you remind yourself of what you can be in Christ. One of the best things that we can do for other people in the world is to speak life into ourself. Speak productivity upon yourself. Speak forgiveness that's already been granted to you by God over yourself. You see, long before we tear other people down with our words, we tear down ourselves with a negative self-talk. The way we uplift others is a direct result of how we uplift ourselves. That's how we're a blessing. The other day I was at the Dodger game. I was so negative. I, I, I caught myself in the worst negative trail. Every single time it was no ball. I'm gonna look at it again. Another no balls, two strikes count. Here we go, probably going to strike out again. Every time I kept saying we are going to strike out, we did. 17 times out of 27 outs were strikeouts. It was almost as if I was speaking strikeouts into the team and they could somehow feel it. I don't think I could take credit for it, but it was weird. Or maybe. And I, and I woke up this morning, I just said, you know what, the Dodgers are going to win. We're going to win. I got that negativity out. We're going to win 8-1 to one tonight, 5-2 to two tomorrow, and we're going to clinch the series, and we're going to come home, and the Dodgers are going to win the World Series. And they're going to donate their bonus check to the Dream Center. It's just, it's just going to be amazing. But a productive life is, is, is what we do with our talents and what we do with the truth of the Word of God. Do we, declare, do we declare that the Bible is the absolute truth of the Word of God? Or do we doubt its power? If you want to spend your life being productive for others, you've got to start being productive in speaking the truth of the Word of God and the promises of the Word of God over yourself. If you want to love those that are closest to you, then you must choose to speak life over yourself so that you can live in the overflow of that conversation of encouragement over that declaration. See, here's a characteristic of a productive life. Here are some characters. I just wrote them down. I didn't get this from any. I just wrote them down. So if the vocabulary is off, it's, you can prove it's mine. Amen. But here are the characteristics of a productive life. The ability to serve when you need to be served. The courage to bounce back quickly from defeat. The rejection of a bad seed or thought process taking root. Chooses to be happy. Rejects bitterness at all costs. Fights the erosion of the soul due to years of disappointment. Trusts God's word is the final word. Speaks life into, into future things others might fear on the horizon. And listens to the nudge of the Holy Spirit when it comes to generosity and random acts of kindness. Now here are the characteristics of a destructive life. Will not leave past offenses alone. Folds into a shell when things don't go their way. Will occasionally give joy to others when the circumstances are right. Tremendous doubt of the future. Lack of belief in the validity and truth of the word of God changes the standard of the word of God because they find the instructions too hard, would rather play it safe than take a risk for God, gives up on others easy, and lives in the spirit of fear and suspicion. You see, God wants us to live productive in the way that we talk, in the way that we think, and the way that we live towards others. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 through 16 says, Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I want you to underline that. Making the most out of every opportunity. That's what pro productivity is. There's people right now as I'm speaking, I can hear them like uh, um, just over here in this section over here. When, when I say something that they, that they agree with or like or even don't like, but just whatever, 
They're just amening. Why? They're just being productive with the opportunity that's before them. They're encouraging. And some of you do it with smiles. You don't have to shout. But some of you do it with your smiles and your head nods. And, uh, and every once in a while, someone will tell me a score of a game. Appreciate that, too. But, uh, but a five-second hug can be making the most out of every opportunity. Have you ever watched, like, uh, on YouTube, like, sports clips uh, of, like, sports clips? That's a haircut. Um, but sports stuff from the greatest plays in baseball or basketball? Like, you watch, like, five minutes of the greatest catches or the greatest dunks and, and, and the highlight reels. I love watching, like, those clips. Man, you go back to the days where 19, like, 80s and, like, and like 90s, and Ken Griffey Jr. jumping over the wall and, like, all these crazy old school clips and new school. And you watch these highlight reels. And I thought, man, those, I mean, those are built by extraordinary moments of, of doing great things. And, and what is the highlight reel of our life? What's the thing that we look back over and say that that, 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 is, that high five you gave someone was a turning point in their life? That hug that you gave someone, that encouraging word that you told someone in discipleship that, man, eight months in, they're getting ready to throw in the towel. And you say, don't you quit because you're going to miss your destiny if you quit. And they shake their head. They're like, okay, I'm not going to quit. They graduate, they change the world, they make a difference, and they do something great in their life. Why do they do it? Because of a highlight real moment in your life where you said something that brought life to their soul. Every time we do something productive for the kingdom of God in our words and our deeds or generosity or anything, it's a part of a highlight reel of our life, and our life is shaped by moments of what we do in the past that build upon our confidence of the future. Or what about a greatest hits album? A collection of very best songs and moments. The other day, I was listening to George Strait, Greatest Hits. George Strait, man, they, that guy is unbelievable. Country music fans, it's, it's all about, it's not Garth Brooks, he's great, but George Strait. It's all about George Strait. I like George Strait so much, I even gave him a name in Spanish. Jorge Derecho. George Strait. Isn't that awesome? Jorge Derecho. This is from, I, I mean... And so I listen to volume one of his greatest hits, 25 songs. But not, there's not just a volume one. There's a volume two. There's a volume three. There's like a hundred like greatest hits even this, going all the way back. And I, I said, man, I want my life to be a George Strait greatest hits album of the Christian life. Where they look back, they're like, man, there's just so many songs. There's so many memories. There's so many things. There are so many defining moments. And I'm not just talking about big things that we do. Because the truth is, it's all about the little things that we deposit in other people's lives that launch them into their future and launch them into their destiny. Make your life a greatest hits. And that can start right now by making a decision to make everything in your life a ministry. Don't worry about a budget. Don't worry about anything unless you're doing a tipping ministry. You have to have a little bit of a budget, but whatever. But make your life just live to be a difference maker. The great thing about life is that we don't have to search for opportunity to make a difference and to be productive. Those moments are all around us. Those moments are here. You've got to get out of yourself. and You've got to put yourself in someone else's world and decide. I'm going to live a life of productivity. Otherwise, I don't, I'm going to live into a shell where I let fear and anxiety and bitterness and grudges begin to form places and, and, and create things in me that I never wanted to happen. God wants us to rise up on the inside and start taking our life back through the power and the confidence of what the cross has already given us, and that is to do great things. And it, the disciples enter into a destructive place in their life of sadness and discouragement and mourning after Jesus died. They were in that place of, 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 of frustration and, and um, regret, and they were kind of hanging around that place. But when Jesus touched their heart and mandated them and sent them back into the mission field and told them, look, you've made some mistakes, but you have time to be productive. You, can, you left me on the cross, but I need you to tell about me in the future. Peter got so excited when he heard the Lord, he jumped out of the boat. Some say he had no clothes on. I don't know, but whatever he did, he jumped out of that boat. He swam to the seashore and said, you mean I have another chance to be productive? And Jesus launched him and sent him into an unbelievable era of his life, the best life that he could ever live after being in a place of destructive behavior in his own life. You can be productive. Now is the time to get out of regret, 
get out of the basement, get out of that dark space of our soul that says you will never be useful again and just start being activated in day-to-day ministry by the way that you choose to bring life to situations around you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, all over this room. It's time to be productive. If you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm, I'm living a life of destructive behavior. Maybe you haven't done anything extremely of what the world would call severe, but maybe the destructive is you used to be a person that forgave so easy, now it's almost impossible to forgive. Or you used to be a person that believed the best in people, now culture has shaped you into the cynical kind of sort of a monster in your soul that started to develop. But today you just want to start being productive. That's why the Bible says taking, taking every thought captive. That's why Philippians 4a talks about an aggressive strategy on which things to think about. The great thing about being pr- productive for God is you can start right now. You don't have to wait five years to be productive. It's a mindset. It's a belief system. It's, it's just a, a mentality that you get up every day and say, how can I be a life-giving person? How can I be an encourager? And all over this room today you'll say, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm away from God. I'm not where I need to be, but I want to do the most productive thing I could ever do with my life, and that is to trade in my sin and my, sh- my sorrow for a relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm turning away from the old, and I'm embracing what Jesus has for me. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands, and I want you to lay aside sorrow, lay aside the greatest mistakes you've made in your life, lay aside the darkest hour, of words that you said that might have torn down every bridge of hope back to the future. Everything that is in your life that has been destructive, I want you to throw aside all of that. And I just want you to take a step towards towards Jesus, where suddenly everything becomes productive. You give your life to Christ, it's, it's like everything in the past is the past, and now it's, it's like your life has just begun. People looking for a chance to start over, if you give your life to Jesus Christ, that's the only, that, that's, that is the start over. That, your life hasn't even started until you've given your life to Christ. So you can't hold yourself condemned for what you've done in the past because you've never really started life until you've known Jesus. So now is your chance to start a whole new life by giving it all to Jesus today. Your sin, your sorrow, your shame, repenting of the old, and having a true restart now. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. If you want that for your life, one, the Holy Spirit is moving. Two, if that's you, I want you to raise your hands. When I say three, I believe God's about to do something. Are you ready? One, two, three, do something productive. Just raise your hand in the air and say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Hands are going up all over this room. Hands are, it doesn't matter how destructive you've been. One one step towards Jesus is, is a thousand times more productive than the million steps you've taken backwards. Hands are going up everywhere, all over this room. You're responding to God that's calling you to to do something with your past and make it productive in the future by knowing Christ. Hands are going up. Praise God. Everyone that raised your hands and you that did, but you need prayer together, loud and strong. Everyone in this room, repeat these words after me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross that I might be saved. I repent of my sin, and I give you my future. I want to be productive. And you were productive for me when you died on the cross for my sin. Now I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.